Design Thinking with Tinkercad. Welcome, welcome. We're very happy that you're here. Um, this is Kelly Ann. Uh, I am a youth program specialist at Autodesk, and I'm also very excited that Louis Baptista, is it Baptista? It's Baptista. Baptista. So Louis, uh, Louis uh, from the United Way is also joining us today, and he's going to be supporting me with the question and answer um, and making sure that participants are engaged uh, throughout this today's uh, webinar episode. So glad you're here. Uh, we were just talking about the weather um, and the Northeast, it's gonna be a little bit crazy today. Um, so just checking that out. I should shut off notifications on my phone as well. Uh, and we're gonna be getting started officially at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, but for now, if you wanna get started on the warm up activity, uh, we're gonna be looking at a series of images. Uh, and you're gonna be thinking about, cause today we're gonna be uh, exploring the design thinking process. Uh, and we're gonna be thinking about questions such as uh, who might this be designed for and what problem might it be solving or addressing. So I'm gonna show you a series of images. Lewis is gonna help me out with the question and answer. Uh, and you are going to be just thinking about these two questions for each image. So who do you, and you're making a guess because you've probably never seen these images before. Um, so you're gonna be answering who is this product or space designed for? And what problem might it be solving or addressing? Uh, we know that our designs attempt to solve problems. They may not be able to solve problems, but they can at least minimize the um, negative effects of a problem by addressing it. Uh, so the first image that we're gonna be looking at is this one. So again, if you're just joining us, welcome to the Future of Construction webinar, uh, today brought to you by Autodesk in the United Way. Uh, so I am Kelly Ann. Uh, Lewis is here from the United Way. He's gonna be supporting us today. Um, welcome, Lewis. Uh, and so what we're doing right now uh, is looking at a series of images. So this is the first image that we're gonna be looking at today. You've probably never seen this image before. So we're making guesses and inferences about the image. So for this first image and for each of the images, you're gonna be responding in the question and answer that you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you're gonna be responding, who do you think this, in this instance, it's a space. So who do you think this space is designed for? So who is the intended user of this space? And what problem do you think this space may be addressing or uh, solving? So I'll give you a few minutes to look at this image and to think about those two questions. So who is this designed for? What problem might this design be addressing? You might even let Lewis know in the question and answer um, even just some things that you notice about the image too, or questions that you have about the image. Louis, are we noticing anything in the question and answer yet? No, nope, nothing yet. Nothing yet. So it is a beautiful image to look at. Um, and again, if you're just joining us, the warm up activity for today is we're going to look at a series of images. And in the question and answer, you're going to respond to each image. Who do you think that this was designed for? And what problem do you think they might be, the designer might be addressing? through this design. So who do you think is the intended user? In this case, it's a space. So who was this space designed for? What problem do you think that it might be trying to solve? We have one guess, uh, people. Okay, <laughs> so, so for people, um, I wonder- Another if guess? Yep. Any other for guesses? Citizens? For citizens? Mm -hmm. You might the also make- The problem was the water of overflowing? 
Okay, so thinking about maybe water overflowing or flooding could be the problem that the designer is trying to address. And thinking about the users, we see some, I think, representations of who might be the user of this space. What does it look like they're doing? Hmm. Again, if you're just joining us, welcome to the Future of Construction webinar series uh, brought to you today by Autodesk in the United Way. So right now what we're doing is we're gonna be looking at a series of images. This is the first in the series of image, images. And in the question and answer, you're gonna be responding to two questions for each photo or each image. The first question is, who do you think that this space is designed for. So who is the intended user of this space? And really think about who that, that user is. If you say it's a person, you know, think, think about more specifically about like what, maybe what type of person might be a user of this space. You know, is it a young person? Is it an older person? So think even about demographics. The other question that you could be responding to is what problem do you think the designer of this space is attempting to address through this design? So you may answer these questions in the question and answer, and Lewis is going to let us know what people are saying. So Lewis, any other responses? Yep, we have one guess, schools, another guess, uh, or a question actually, is that a college? Hmm, interesting. I'm wondering what details would make us think that it's potentially a school or a college. I mean, it kind of has yeah, like, sort of like a campusy sort of feel to it. Um, like the buildings are sort of like connected by the green space. Any other questions or comments, Lewis? Uh, use for the community of young. Okay, so for young people. Mm -hmm. And we have two questions. Is it an ice skating rink? And is it a rich person? It does. It, it is. It does look like they, they are skating because I see in that kind of round uh, space in the foreground of the image, I see little people uh, and it looks like there is ice there uh, and it looks like there's marks on the um, surface of the water there that looks like the marks um, from ice skates and kind of the posture of some of the figures in the foreground look as if they are skating. So, hmm, I'll tell you more about this image later. Let's move on to the next image. So here's another image. This isn't a space, it's a product. Um, again, uh, welcome to the Future of Construction webinar series. Uh, if you're just joining us, my name is Kellyanne Mahoney. I'm a youth program specialist at Autodesk. We are also joined today by Lewis from the United Way. Uh, hey, Lewis. And Lewis is going to be helping us with the question and answer today, uh, particularly. So right now we are responding in the question and answer uh, for the warm up activity. We're going to be looking at a series of images. So this is the second in the series of images. Don't worry if you missed the first one. We're going to be hopping back and going over what the designs are. Um, but right now we're getting into the design thinking mindset because the topic of today is design thinking with Tinkercad. And what you're gonna be typing into the question and answer is looking at the image and really thinking about who is this designed for? So who is the intended user of this product? And you're gonna make a guess because you probably have no idea. You've probably never seen this image before. So the first question is who is this for? And the second is uh, what problem uh, do you think the designer is trying to address through this product in this case? So, so again, we have some guesses that it might be a Fitbit. Interesting, it does. It has a look like a Fitbit. Mm -hmm. We have another guess. Is it a watch or a bracelet? Hmm. Interesting question. So thinking about like it's, um, you know, it has a beautiful form to it uh, and the color and the texture is really nice, um, but also thinking about what is its function. And maybe it's a multi-function. Any other guesses about this image, Lewis? Uh, and then we have a cascade of Fitbit guesses. It looks like a bracelet, a Fitbit, uh, some other watch. 
So bracelet, Fitbit, a watch. Maybe to track your steps. Hmm. Maybe the function is to track your steps, kind of similar to a Fitbit. We have a comment saying that it's beautiful. It is. I really do actually think that this, I'm trying to be just focused on what I notice in my um, objective observations, but I do actually really like this design. It is beautiful. The, I like the combination of colors. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have a good guess here. Uh, it is made of granite, so it is probably not meant for wearing. Hmm. So maybe, so thinking about um, the the texture and the um, the look of the material that you think that it might potentially be granite. So if it's made of granite, that would be very difficult for a user to wear, probably would be uncomfortable. All right, let's take another like 30 seconds or so with this image and then we're going to move on to the next one. So again, if you're just joining us, welcome to the Future of Construction webinar series. Uh, warm up activity is to look at the image and tell us in the question and answer, uh, who do you think this is designed for? And what problem do you think it's trying to address? Any more before we move on to the next image, Lewis? Um, someone's guessing that it's a calculator. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Or it could be like an Alexa, like a homeowner thing. Huh. Cool, so maybe it's like a virtual assistant. On Tuesday, when we talked uh, to Khalif from Mass Robotics, he talked about the differences between a robot and a virtual assistant. All right, moving on to the next image. So this is an interesting one. So who do you think this is designed for? So in this case, it's a space. In what problem do you think that this design is attempting to address? It has a podium, so maybe it is just a rich person statue. Hmm. I'm noticing this like the last couple of images we thought about in terms of the type of people that this is for, that maybe it's for rich people, which is interesting. We have another guess. Uh, it might be a company. Hmm. Yeah, so maybe it's some type of an industrial building or space. The cool thing about these images is they, um, my guess is that a lot of them are actually renderings, which means it's like a photorealistic representation of a design that hasn't actually been built yet. Someone's guessing that it's a dam or a levee hmm. or something to do with pollution. So we did talk about dams a little bit yesterday and talking about flooding with the Boston Children's Museum. Um, so that's interesting. And then what was the other one you said, Lewis? Uh, something to do with pollution. Hmm. So maybe it, it has some sort of function having to do with pollution. All right, let's- A hotel for up. people going to the polls. What is it? A hotel for people visiting the polls. Huh. So a hotel for people. So thinking about maybe this was a building for a very extreme environment, like the the North or South Pole, and this could be a, what a hotel would look like there. I wonder what details are making you think about that. Let's move on to the next image. So again, uh, if you are just joining us, this is the Future of Construction webinar series. Uh, we're working on our warm up activity right now, which is to look at a series of images and to think about who you think, in this case, it's a product. And I'm gonna tell you to focus on the garment that the person is wearing. Um, so who do you think that this product, and I'm talking about the garment, is designed for? What? And what do you think the purpose is? Or not purpose, but also what problem do you think it's trying to uh, address or solve? Keep people warm for cold weather. Hmm. A Nike advertisement. Hmm. It does kind of have a little bit of a Nike aesthetic to it. I think it's with a the hero with the shadow. What was the other one, Lewis? Uh, a wetsuit. A wetsuit? Mm -hmm. 
So again, looking at the image, particularly we're focusing on this garment that the model is wearing. Who do you think it's designed for? And what problem do you think it might be attempting to address? Measuring body heat was another guess. Hmm. I wonder how. Fashion technology for humans? Hmm. Fashion technology for humans, which is a very interesting field right now. Some guesses that it's a shirt, another guess that it's for runners. Hmm. So thinking about specifically, it's not just designed for people, it's designed to, for a particular subgroup of people. All right, take a couple more seconds to look at this one. And Lewis, what, anything else? Yeah, two more guesses. I think that it is uh, designed for people in the north and to keep people warm. Hmm. So a lot of people making inferences that this is a garment for people who live in cold climates. Right, moving on to the next one. I think this might be one of the last ones. Um, so again, uh, warm up activity, looking at the image. If you're just joining us, you're typing your responses in the question and answer, and you're letting Lewis know um, who you think in this case is kind of a combination of a product and a space. So who do you think this is designed for? And what problem do you think that uh, the designer is addressing through this design? Any responses, Lewis? Nope, I think folks are thinking nothing has come in yet. I'll give you a hint that this is both a product and a space. So who is this? Irrigation. For? What is it, Lewis? Irrigation. It still might have something to do with irrigation, so maybe redirecting water in some way. Any other guesses? Might even make a guess if you think it's irrigation, how, how might it work? What do you think is happening? It shows what's happening under the floor. Public officials probably use it for mapping out pipes and stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting kind of like a cross section, the way that the uh, image is represented. So we can see both underground and um, it, it kind of like cuts into the, um, into the scene. So it's an interesting way of representing um, a process as well. We have a guess that it's, it, it might be for a neighborhood, like a heated walkway of sorts. Oh, so maybe it has something to do with the, the walkway. Um, I did say that it is both a product and a space. Um, so maybe it has something to do with uh, some function of the walkway. All right, let's move on to that. Oh, one more guess, Lewis. Yeah, gardening and producing food. Okay, so maybe the, the purpose is trying to uh, maybe have some sort of both an irrigation and a gardening or agricultural purpose. Let's move on to the next one. And I think this is the last one. So again, if you're just joining us, it's okay. We're gonna go over these images. We're just playing a bit of a guessing game for the warm up activity. Uh, the topic for today is design thinking with uh, Tinkercad and we're putting on our design thinking caps right now uh, and thinking about these images and who uh, these products or spaces are designed for and what problem they may be solving through their design. So this is the last one. I will quickly go over these with you so that you don't have to keep guessing and I'll try to remember what they all are. So let Lewis know in the question and answer, uh, who is this designed for and what problem may it be, may it be solving or addressing? This does look like a different region of the world than what we've seen uh, in the previous images in terms of thinking of who it's for. We have a couple of guesses uh, around water, honeycombs for trapping water or just mitigating flooding. Interesting. And I like how you talked about the shape as well, that it's a honeycomb. Uh, that's actually relevant to uh, one of our learning objectives today. We're going to be talking about how sometimes designers, so architects and engineers use nature as a design partner. So thinking about how uh, we can use shapes in nature, not only to make our environment more beautiful, but also more functional. So that's a really good guess. 
Any other comments, Louis? Uh, flood prevention, uh, making flood less likely. Yep, so making flood less likely and flood prevention. All right, so this is the last one. We're gonna stop here, uh, and I'm gonna tell you actually where I found uh, all of these images. So just to cite my sources, I used to be an English teacher. <laughs> so this is from DZine Magazine, uh, which is a design magazine in, um, it's in the Netherlands, I believe, or no, it's in London, uh, but these designs are actually uh, from a Dutch um, design contest. So it was eight designers who were thinking about how they could use design to address climate change. So I will try to remember what they all are, but if not, you can check out the article and Lewis can send you the link to where you can find it in the chat if you're interested. Um, so I think this is Copenhagen. Um, and it is, which I think is an, on an island, uh, and it is addressing the issue of flooding. Uh, so thinking about uh, ways in which rather than trying to build dams to mitigate floods, how we can just embrace the fact that our environment could flood. Um, so how could we um, take the environment and make it adaptable to flood flooding? So in this uh, part of the space, uh, they created an ice skating rink in order to, um, to make the flooded environment more useful. Uh, this is actually, someone had said, uh, this looks like a Fitbit. This is actually a Fitbit, but for climate change. So this is a speculative design. It doesn't exist yet, but the idea was that the designer was thinking about how we could take that concept of a Fitbit and make it more of a Fitbit, not to track your exercise, but to track your carbon footprint. So how could it take in information about like how much food you're eating and how much, um, the, the mode in which you're transporting yourself and how could it compile all, all that data so that you could find out um, not just how healthy you are, but how your actions are impacting the health of the environment. Uh, this is a, so someone said it's an industrial looking space, it is. Um, this is a power plant that, a concept for a power plant that would incinerate trash. It also has a ski slope along the side of it. So really interesting way of making a space really super functional. And then also it is taking carbon dioxide out of the environment in that circle at the top. It's a ring of smoke and every time a ton of carbon dioxide is removed from the environment through the power plant, it has a little ring of smoke that comes out of the top. Uh, this garment is actually, um, it is I think for surfers or people who, um, particularly who are at the beach, uh, in our into water sports uh, that it is a garment that is dyed with cabbage um, but every time the garment touches water that's polluted it changes color so it can let you know if the water is polluted. Uh, this is uh, so this uh, picture can us a little bit. Um, this is irrigation or it's bricks that absorb rainwater that then redirect the rainwater uh, into the ground, into the groundwater in order to um, support, you know, any of the landscaping that's around the, the pavers. And I think that something like this does already exist. Uh, and this finally is, uh, this was designed for uh, Delta uh, regions. So places where um, river water is kind of combining with uh, ocean water, so it makes kind of a brackish water, uh, and the land is actually the result of sediment from the river. So it's kind of places like when we think of like in the United States, like New Orleans, for example, or Southern Florida, uh, experience a lot of floods as well. So this is a way of thinking about taking the natural environment. So in Delta regions, there's mangroves that grow, that's like type of shrub shrubbery uh, in mangrove, in, delta regions and to kind of redirect the shrubbery rather than building a dam, just take what's already there and landscaping it to make it more like a honeycomb shape to create natural dams. Uh, and a lot of people said that it looks like th these were designed for people who are, you know, from the north or people who are more wealthy. Um, the, it was a Dutch designed contest, so a lot of the end users were there who live in northern Europe. Um, so just to let you know also teachers that are tuning in, uh, a lot of the resources that you see me showing today, uh, you can actually find them all in this one resource, which is an instructable, uh, instructional resources published on instructable, uh, on instructables. Um, and you can find, you know, a lot of like the rubrics that I show today, um, the way that you could take this kind of make it green challenge and turn it more into a project. Um, it's a one-stop <laughs> place where you can find a lot of the links today, but Lewis can send you some links in the chat too. 
Uh, so again, if you're just joining us, um, this is the last day of the Future of Construction webinar series. Uh, I'm happy because it's Friday, but I'm sad because I've had fun with you all this week. Um, so today the topic is design thinking with Tinkercad. It is presented by Autodesk, so that's me, uh, Kelly Ann Mahoney. I'm a youth program specialist at Autodesk, and we're also joined by Louis Baptista today, who uh, works the United Way uh, in uh, Massachusetts. So uh, Louis is going to be helping us with the question and answer. Um, Louis, did you want to just say hello? <laughs> of course. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to, to see you. Well, not see you, but virtually uh, see everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for engaging and, and participating. Um, your discussions and your comments uh, make this so much uh, more valuable. So hi, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so those of you, if there's anyone who's just joining today for the first time, just to let you know how to participate. As Lewis said, we can't see you. Um, you can see us. We can't see you the way that we have this set up. Uh, the chat is disabled. So these are the icons that you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the chat is disabled. However, we can chat out to all of the participants. Uh, you can communicate with Lewis and I through the question and answer. Uh, you can also, at some points, I might ask you to raise your hand. And if you click on that, then um, we'll see that your hand is raised. So if we might wanna pull you uh, with some questions, we might ask that. Uh, so our goals for today are to apply design thinking methods to a real world problem. So we're gonna dig deeply into that design challenge that we've been talking about over the course of the week or the two of them that you can choose from. We're also gonna discuss how architects and designers use nature as a design partner. And we're also going to practice design and technical skills in a fun and nurturing environment. We hope this has been a fun and nurturing environment with you. We feel like we are trying to adapt and innovate uh, in this new distance learning environment. Um, in my job, uh, oftentimes if I am working with Lewis, we have actual middle schoolers in the space with us physically <laughs> and we're you know, doing fun activities at the Autodesk office. So uh, we're hoping to kind of maintain that same level of fun and engagement in this uh, new sort of learning environment. Uh, things might go a little bit long today, so um, I'm gonna try to wrap up uh, all of our objectives by the end, uh, but I know that some of you really wanted to dig more deeply into Tinkercad, so I'm gonna be doing a Tinkercad session um, more in depth at the end if you wanna hang around. This is also being recorded and we'll show you where you can find the recordings today too. So today I'm gonna be showing you later on in demonstration of how I created this design in Tinkercad that was inspired by that, um, the more kind of fancy design <laughs> that you see at the end. We're also gonna talk about the design thinking process today and how you can use the design thinking process in order to address the design challenges that we've presented to you. Uh, so these are the different stages. And when you hear the word design thinking, there are kind of many different ways of going about it. Um, essentially design thinking is trying to address a problem through design and making sure that in each step of the process that you're keeping humans at the center of it. So you might hear of different ways of going about design thinking, but the really the most important part of design thinking is not forgetting that of, of who the end user is of what you're designing and also who the other stakeholders are. So sometimes you have a particular end user, but there are other people affected by what it is that you're designing. So just keeping humans at the center. Uh, so we're going to begin by thinking about uh, empathizing. We'll do a little empathy activity, which is usually the first stage of any design thinking process. So really thinking about the problem that you're trying to solve and who are the people that are most uh, impacted by that problem. Uh, define stage is really thinking about really digging deep into really understanding the problem. Um, and then once you have a good sense of who the end user is, the problems that they're facing, you really have a good understanding of that problem. Then you start to come up with as many ideas as you possibly can, and they could be silly and crazy ideas at first, like putting a ski slope on a, on a, you know, a, a power plant, for example. Um, so it's okay to have crazy ideas in the ideate phase. All you're really trying to think about is how many ways you could possibly solve the problem for the end user. And then from there, you're gonna prototype. So you're gonna try to take your solution that you've come up through the ideation phase, maybe it's the best one or the one that you think um, you are most passionate about. And then you're gonna try to put it into a model or a form that others can understand. And the purpose of prototyping is just to be able to put your idea out there in a way that you can test your idea. 
So you might test your idea through, you know, a verbal presentation where you're presenting it to a potential end user, a potential stakeholder, or a potential investor. You could test your idea by putting your prototype out there and uh, having a survey, so surveying people about your prototype. You could test your prototype by actually like making sure that it works and having people test it out um, and to tell you about their experience as a user. So that's the, my summary of the design thinking process. Uh, what I want you guys to do now is I'm going to play a film that I think goes through a lot of the different phases of the design thinking process that I just spoke of. Uh, and I want you to, as you're watching this quick film, I want you to think about th this is a, a group of entrepreneurs uh, and they are talking about a problem that they're trying to solve through their product. I want you to think about those questions. So who are they designing this product for? How do they identify that end user? How do they show empathy for that end user? And then what are some other aspects of the design thinking process that you see that this startup is using? So you feel free to chat with Lewis in the question and answer throughout the film. Uh, it's about a minute and a half long. I'm David. And I'm Kevin. With our partner, Ben, we found a Boreo. <laughs> We make skateboards from recycled fish nets collected along the coast of Chile. We needed to figure out how we were going to do it. Basically, take something that's just an idea, bring it through the prototype phase and into the development phase, and continue to grow. The first thing was just kind of struggling with where is this plastic coming from? Why, when we go to Australia, California, Southeast Asia, everywhere you see plastic in the ocean? We knew it needed to be something where we could take this commodity, this plastic, and turn it into a high value product. And then one thing that we found that really didn't have any solutions, didn't have a recycling program, was fishing nets. There was no infrastructure in place to dispose the nets properly, so they were damaging the ecosystem. We wanted to show people that there's value in this discarded material. These nets make up 10% of the plastic trash in the ocean. With limited recycling options, it made sense for us to work with this material. We had that aha moment and said, why don't we make a plastic skateboard? We all surf and we all skate. It was our way of expressing our passion while also creating a solution to this harmful material. The surfing skating culture, because of their outdoor involvement, they can know that by buying a board that they are making a difference. Crowdfunding enables young innovators to get projects off the ground. A startup program in Chile gave us the opportunity to take our ideas from Australia to South America. We set up a program to buy back old fishing nets from the fishermen. The nets are collected, transported to our recycling facility in Santiago, shredded, repelletized, and injection molded into skate decks. This started as a basic sketch on a napkin. From the very first sketches, we went through 50 different versions before we landed on the one that we all love. You're never gonna get everything right the first time. Nothing goes smoothly, and you're gonna have setbacks, and the difference between success and failure is how you deal with those, and how you move past them, and continue to grow. We really wouldn't be able to do what we've done so far with Boreo if it wasn't for what we learned in college. There are so many new tools, like Autodesk, available now to help young designers. Turning something that exists on a computer screen into reality, as opposed to just thinking of one giant problem it's no breaking that up into kind of little pieces when you have a career that has a passion behind it and has a meaning behind it you're going to put that much more energy into it a lot of kids they feel like they're forced to do things because that's what you know maybe an investor is interested in if you just step back and say okay what am i good at what am i passionate about you'll find success as opposed to trying to walk someone else's path So going back to the film, um, so what did, so in thinking about this film, uh, what aspects, so how are these uh, innovators and entrepreneurs, how are they using the design thinking process? So how did you see them using the design thinking process? Uh, you might also even just answer who, who were they designing this product for? Who is their intended end user? Any responses, Lewis? Uh, none yet. So who were they designing this, this product for? Who was the intended end user? What was the product that they were designing? Who could explain that? Uh, for themselves? 
so they may have been designing, so they, they may be part of the group that um, they're designing for. What was the product that they're designing? Skateboards. Yep, so it's a skateboard uh, made out of what? So they're designing a skateboard, but it was innovative. So um, they used a unique material. Does anybody remember what it was? Used fishing nets. Yep, so they used just, so there was a problem that they identified. Uh, so using the design thinking process, they identified a problem that wasn't currently being solved in the status quo, which was that um, fishing, fishing nets were not being recycled, they're being reused, they're being discarded into the ocean. Uh, which was polluting the ocean. So they decided to use that as an in interesting material to make skateboards out of. Who, so who is the end user of a skateboard? Inspiration for young people, skateboards. Mm -hmm. So, so the, their end user of the skateboard is a skateboarder, right? Um, so, but what else did they notice about people who are skateboarders? It also overlapped with another user group. What was the other user group that also tends to skate that they said? They were designing a product for the earth that would help keep a bunch of people entertained. Yeah, so they were designing for the earth to help people entertain. And one of the things that they had noticed about their end user is that skateboarders also tend to be surfers as well. So there's some overlap between surfing and skateboarding. And they thought that uh, particularly that group, that very specific user group, skaters and surfboarders, that people who are surfers would actually be concerned about this problem in the ocean. Because the ocean, if the ocean is too polluted, they can't surf. Um, so in thinking of, so I thought that was a good example of how these innovators use the design thinking process in order to come up with a product that they thought was relevant to their end user. So through uh, next week and the following week, uh, if you are participating in the design challenge and planning to submit uh, your design to the Children's Museum as part of the virtual exhibit that we'll be hosting, um, this is one of the design challenges that you can choose. So this is one of the problems that you can try to solve through design, which is to create a model that shows how you would address an issue of environmental justice in your neighborhood or community. So this is one of the two prompts that you can um, that you can address. You're going to explain how your design solves this problem through images, words, numbers, a 3D digital model, and or a physical model. So I also thought that that video that we just showed actually did a good job of using all of those things in order to express their idea. Um, the second design challenge that you can choose from, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, is to create a model that shows how you would solve a problem that Thompson Island is facing. So your cool down activity yesterday was to think about these two design challenges and decide which of the two you're going to focus on for your project. Uh, so you should already have that in mind. Uh, raise your hand. So option one is the issue of environmental justice in your neighborhood or community. Raise your hand if you think of the two options, this is the one that you want to uh, go forward with. So raise your hand if you're thinking option one, which is this one. So Lewis, how many people are choosing, just as a, a ratio, how, about how many are using or fraction, how many are using choosing option one? We're averaging 13 and 14 participants. Okay. And then option two, so lower, actually I can lower everyone's hands. So raise your hand if you think that you're gonna choose option two. So to solve a problem for Thompson Island. That looked like, looks like more. I can't see how many. Right now, Lewis, can you tell me if it's like maybe like more than half or, or choosing option two? Option two, we have about four or five participants who are raising their hands. Okay. All right. So more people are choosing option one then. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so everyone should have in mind which of the two that they are gonna be choosing to work on. I wanna take just like a minute or two, I'm not gonna take a super long time, but I want to show you this empathy map canvas. So this would be a good first step for you in thinking about how you could use the design thinking process to address the design challenge that you're thinking of. So for the empathy map canvas, uh, you begin with number one. So who are you, so if you're solving the problem for Thompson Island, think about um, you know, who are the people that you're solving the problem for. So yesterday, Chaya uh, and Jay uh, talked about you know, the people who work on the island, but they also talked about other people who, um, who experience the island um, and who, um, who's pro who might have a problem on the island. So I just wanna give you like a minute or two to look through these questions from the empathy map. For those of you who are teachers who are on, this is linked to that um, instructable that I showed you earlier. Uh, and this is a great graphic organizer to use with students if they're thinking about a design thinking process and trying to map out the needs and the goals of the end user. So I just wanna give you a minute or two to look this over. And you might think about it in your head in terms of how you might answer these problems or answer these questions. You might also let Lewis know in the question and answer um, who you might be solving a problem for through your design. Lewis, are we seeing anyone responding about who their end user might be of their design? No responses as of yet. So I'll give you another minute just to think about these questions. Later on, we're gonna talk a little bit about constraints. So when we're designing something, we don't want, we wanna design with purpose. We wanna design in a way that's very deliberate. Um, so we don't wanna design something that's totally random. We wanna design something that actually solves a problem uh, for a particular user group. Can anyone identify? We have a couple of we have a couple of guesses, Kellyanne, my community, everyone that lived there, mm -hmm. um, the people in the community. Cool, so thinking about that first prompt, the issue of environmental justice. And I often think this, particularly if it's your first time doing something like this, I often think that it's good to choose a problem that uh, just like how someone had said in that, uh, the video that I showed that the end user was also could have been, you know, it seemed like those guys were into surfing and skating. It is a good idea for your first time doing a design challenge like this, that you might actually try to tackle a problem that not only uh, people in your community suffer from, but maybe something that you've experienced yourself as well, because that really helps with that empathy pro process if you are someone who's also affected by that problem. Um, one of the issues that I was thinking about in terms of environmental justice, um, and I'm not sure if, if Melissa or if it was um, Taylor who showed it, was the heat map of Boston. And I'm really fascinated by the issue of tree equity in the city of Boston. Because if you look at that tr the heat map of the city of Boston, East Boston, for example, is one of the neighborhoods that's like the brightest red. It's the, the uh, neighborhood that they, that officials think might be most impacted by climate change if we don't do something about it. And one of the things, if they overlay that heat map with also the number of trees in a particular neighborhood, East Boston is a neighborhood that has least amount of trees and it's also the hottest neighborhood. So uh, in thinking about um, who your end user is, I, again, I encourage you to, to really choose a, a problem that you wanna solve that you feel really passionate about and it might be because you've been impacted by it yourself. Right, so just moving on to the next part of our session. Oh, so uh, this was just a, uh, another aspect of the design thinking process that I thought could help us visualize. What do you think I'm representing here in this image? What part of the design thinking process do you think could be represented through this image? Is it the empathy phase? Is it the understand phase? Is it the ideate phase? Take a guess. Some, some guesses, brainstorm, prototype. Mm -hmm. So those are all part of the design thinking process. Mm -hmm. 
right? I will let you know what it is. So this is um, actually, for me, it makes me think of actually the, the most important part of the design thinking process, in my opinion, which is actually understanding the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, so a lot of times when we attempt to solve a problem, particularly if it is a problem that we face ourselves, is sometimes we narrow in on a certain part of the problem and we don't really see the big picture. Um, so this image is actually inspired by, it's an ancient Indian uh, parable, um, but it's imagine yourself, you're in a dark room, a group of people in a dark room with an elephant. And the elephant is kind of meant to be a metaphor for the problem because whatever perspective, so whatever vantage point you're at in relation to the elephant, you think that it's something else. So one person who's by the legs thinks that the elephant, that the problem, that it's a tree that they're, that's in the room with them. The person who's closest to the tusk thinks it's a spear. The other person uh, who's closest to the trunk thinks it's a snake. The ears, they think it's uh, a fan. And they start to argue about what it is that's in the room, the dark room with them, without actually seeing the big picture. So I really just wanted to emphasize here the, real, the, important of not, the importance of not just skipping over the problem or assuming that you know what the problem is. The purpose of the empathy, empathy phase is to really investigate the problem and make sure that the problem that you're trying to solve through your design is actually the real problem. Oftentimes we jump to solutions before we understand the problem. So any other questions or comments before we move on? And we're gonna get a little bit into Tinkercad next. Lewis, any questions or comments before we move on? Uh, just checking, I don't see any, uh, no question, nope. Cool. Oh, All wait, right, so we just had one come in. Sure. <laughs> How is a wall round? How is a wall round? Um, I get, well, because that's kind of the body of the elephant, so it, it does kind of feel to be at a 90 degree angle, I think, when, uh, you were if you were confronted by something so large. All right, any other questions or comments before we move on? All right, so we're going to dig into Tinkercad now. And I'm going to show you an environment in Tinkercad that you may not be familiar with. So if you are familiar with Tinkercad, which is the product that I primarily support for Autodesk, it's our free uh, entry level browser based, you can use it on a Chromebook, you can use it on an iPad. Um, 3D design uh, tool, and it's for people who are new to 3D design. So there are three environments in Tinkercad. There's the 3D editor, which is probably what you're most familiar with, which is what I'm going to be spending the most of the time demonstrating today. There's also the circuits environment, which is a way that you can uh, simulate electronic designs uh, and also um, do things like power an LED light or a, a use it, you know, figure out how you can use a battery or uh, spin a a motor, for example, um, using Arduino. So um, that is the second environment in Tinkercad. The newest environment, which is about uh, two years old, I think now, is CodeBlocks. Um, and CodeBlocks, and I'm going to show it to you, is a way that you can um, use computational design in order to take your, uh, bring your idea to life in 3D. So this is a design that I didn't actually create in CodeBlocks. This was designed by this woman, Ola Jensen. Uh, who is an architect. So the cool thing about the Tinkercad community is that we, you know, oftentimes share our designs and make them public in the gallery so that other people can use them and tinker with them. Uh, so what you see here is the code blocks environment. If you're familiar with Scratch, you probably are familiar with uh, block space coding. It's actually basically the same blocks that we use in Scratch, but they do different things. Um, so the blocks in Tinkercad that you're putting together um, to create your design are not just being placed along the X and Y axis, which is kind of, you know, what you would be doing in Scratch, for example. There's also the Z axis, which makes your design three-dimensional. So you can actually design things in code in Tinkercad, um, but you can actually make something that's 3D that you could bring to, to life through using a 3D printer, for example, or you could use like a, a die cut machine, uh, like a Cricut, for example, to, to um, fabricate your design. So what you're looking at right now is a design by someone, uh, an architect who's really inspired by nature. And what you see her doing here is she's using math in order to uh, create a design. Can anyone guess what it's supposed to look like? 
and I'm going to zoom in on it. What does that look like to you? Any guesses, Lewis? It looks like something I did in Python. Okay, interesting. A uh, pineapple, a beehive. Okay, so it, it looks, sorry, yeah. Nope, I was just saying pineapple, beehive, bowl, uh, the middle part of a flower, a flower. Yeah. So, and there's a reason why it does actually, I would agree that it looks like all of those things. So the pineapple, um, the, it's actually the, the seeds inside the um, a sunflower, so the, the middle of a sunflower. But the reason why it looks similar is something that we're going to talk about today is that the, uh, the designer is actually inspired by nature in creating her design. And she's inspired by, um, by the sunflower is what she's doing here. And as you can see, the way that I'm not going to pretend to be a mathematician. Uh, I'm a, a former English teacher who's just very interested in making things in art and art um, and also just curious about how to make things and make things with technology. Um, so I'm not going to even attempt to explain the math that you use to create this right now. But one of the things in, in analyzing this, you might notice is the way in which the, um, the different seeds are moving around. So you'll notice that they're moving uh, both uh, clockwise and counterclockwise. They're moving in two different directions. Uh, and that's actually inherent to um, a concept that we're going to talk about, um, which is the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, Fibonacci was a mathematician um, who was really interested. His actually, my daughter helped me make this slide. I didn't know how to animate <laughs> Google Slides. He was actually interested in um, the way that he he was interested in rabbits and the way that they the number of rabbits reproduced in the number sequence that it created when rabbits reproduce. And she put the rabbit twice to, to represent the reproduction of rabbits. <laughs> but the Fibonacci sequence um, is a sequence that um, if you take, and I found this actually from Scientific American, so this is a great video if you want to look for it on YouTube. It's about uh, sunflowers in the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, he discovered a pattern in nature. He started with just looking at kind of the, the way that rabbits reproduced, and you know, there was you know, one and one rabbits makes two, but then one and two, and, and then he, he followed out the sequence. So two, three, five, eight, 13. Um, and then he noticed that in nature, you could find this kind of sequence of numbers um, in, you know, different aspects of nature and that it was repeating. So in the sunflower, for example, uh, if you go back to that sequence, If you were to carry these numbers out, one of the numbers in the Fibonacci sequence is 34. So when we think about the way that the, the seeds, um, the pattern in which the seeds uh, in a sunflower are, um, how they distribute themselves, there's one, one set of spirals, uh, or 34 sets of spirals in one direction. And then in the other direction, uh, the, there are 55. Um, so if you go 34, 55, that's part of the Fibonacci sequence. And actually part of the opti optical illusion that you see when you look at uh, sunflower seeds, it gives it that like super interesting uh, three-dimensionality uh, is part of it's the, um, the, the, the theory is that it is, has to do with that kind of uh, Fibonacci sequence. So in, it's not just something that, uh, the, in, we also call it the golden ratio or the golden mean. Uh, it's not just something that is just aesthetically pleasing. It does look beautiful when we look really closely at, you know, a succulent plant or we look at, um, you know, the, the head of a sunflower. It looks beautiful, but it also solves a function. So, uh, for example, in a sunflower, the way that the seeds are distributed in, uh, in clockwise and then counterclockwise and in this combination of uh, the 33 and the 54, I think, is the, the sequence of numbers that it actually, by the time it gets to the outer edges of the sunflower head, the way that the florets are um, sprouting it, it is an efficient use of space as well. And then this is just because later on we're going to talk about angles uh, when we get into Tinkercad. Uh, there's also a golden angle as well, which is 137. Uh, 0.5 degrees. In this, when we think of the golden 
angle, um, we start to see it uh, in different things. So we think of it as a ratio that is really beautiful and it's uh, universal in terms of the way that it's symbolized in different uh, universal symbols. But we also see it in nature as well. Um, and then that's my impression of me trying to talk about math. <laughs> so uh, in thinking about then how does this, how is this reflected in architecture? Uh, so this is actually a building that was inspired. So we call it, um, it's philoplaxis, I think, is the distribution of seeds along a stem. Um, nature inspires architects to think about making buildings not just beautiful, uh, but also uh, efficient. So for example, this is a concept by an Iranian architect uh, called Saleh Masumi. Uh, and this is his concept for a building that has this sequence of balconies that are laid out in the same way as the seeds in a sunflower head. And it's not just beautiful. So those are different balconies uh, that are jutting out along uh, the edges. It's not just beautiful, but it also serves the function of making each balcony not have um, another balcony blocking it above it. Another building that I really love that I think is beautiful um, is called, and it's similar to that same concept, is called Habitat 67. Uh, this building was actually created uh, in response to the World's Fair in Montreal in 1967. The architect is Moshe Safdi. Uh, and for me, when I look at it, it makes me think of, you know, it's on kind of like the water. It makes me think of like the cliffs on the edge of a water, on the edge of the water. Uh, it also makes me think back to what we talked about on Monday with the future of construction that um, when he designed this building, he wanted to show how uh, living in an urban environment uh, could be both affordable and beautiful. So all of these different kind of parts of the building uh, could be prefabricated. So you can even imagine this design. So this is from 1967. Uh, Currently, like the, there's that aesthetic of building things out of shipping containers. It kind of gives me that kind of sense of that repurposing shipping containers uh, into buildings or thinking about on Monday when we talked about building modular components uh, beforehand and then bringing them to the construction site. So that kind of um, uh, the overlap between manufacturing and construction. Um, so I just really love this building. So what we're talking about here are three concepts. So I used to be an English teacher, so I'm more comfortable talking about words and vocabulary. Um, so there are uh, three words that we're talking about here. Uh, so it's biophilia, biomorphic, and biomimicry. Um, so in thinking about the differences, I'm gonna ask you about this in a second. Biophilia is the idea. So thinking about the end user, it's universal. Uh, it's something that is, you know, psychological and innate in humans to uh, be attracted to or to love nature. So uh, even if you don't even don't notice that, a, you know, a structure that you're in was inspired by nature um, or the feeling that people have, like yesterday we talked about uh, memories in nature and uh, someone had said that they have been finding themselves taking hikes a lot more recently because it helps them feel less stressed. Uh, that's something that is innate in humans, to love nature. So in thinking about designing something in response to these design challenge, if you make your building inspired by nature, chances are your end user is going to love it more because it was inspired by nature. Biomorphic means that the shape of something was inspired by nature. That doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to love it. For example, humans tend to be afraid of things like snakes or insects. Um, so they might not necessarily love your biomorphic design. So you wanna think about things in nature that people actually really love uh, and feel comforted by. The last one is biomimicry. Um, biomimicry is a little bit different from the other words and also has similarities as well. Biomimicry is the idea that not only are you as a designer inspired by nature, in making something beautiful uh, to look like nature. It also is the idea of uh, being inspired by nature and its structure. So not only is it more beautiful because it's inspired by nature, you've also noticed something about a structure in nature that makes your building better. So for example, this building here, 
Uh, so this is what I'm going to be demonstrating later, how you could make something like this in Tinkercad. Uh, so this is called the Abalone House. This is a uh, concept for a building. I'm actually not sure if it's been constructed yet, um, but its roof imitates the geometry of a mollusk shell. Uh, so my first question to you um, is raise your hand if you think that this design is biomorphic. So raise your hand if you think this design is biomorphic. So biomorphic means it's inspired by a shape in nature. Again, raise your hand if you think that this is biomorphic. And I'm noticing most of you think that this is biomorphic. I'm gonna lower all your hands. I'm gonna ask you another question. Uh, so another thing about this design is, uh, so it's inspired by the shell of a mollusk. Uh, it also, in building it, the designer says that because it's inspired by the shell of a mollusk, it requires less material to build because mollusks are more efficient, um, have, a, have an efficient shape that requires it has strength, even though it's made of less materials. Raise your hand if you think the abalone house is also an example of something that is biomimicry. So again, the abalone house is inspired by nature, not just in its beauty, but also in its structure, that it makes it more, uh, have more integrity in its structure. Raise your hand if you think that this is an example of biomimicry. And I'm noticing most of you are raising your hand. And if you're raising your hand, you are correct. So this is also an example of biomimicry. And then with biophilia, I, I would say most people like feel like a shell is something that's beautiful and not threatening. Um, and I would say that this particularly the shape is something that even if I didn't quite at first uh, realize that it was a mollusk shell, I might be attracted to it or want to um, to, to take a closer look at it um, because the, the design is really intriguing. Right, so just in thinking about other ways that, um, that designers and architects are inspired by nature, it's not just their form, it's also even in the material. Uh, for example, these are examples of bioluminescence. In some architects and designers, so bioluminescence is, um, it's, organic uh, living objects that uh, have, they emit light naturally. Uh, some of these actually, the plants, the one on the left-hand side, I think are not doing this naturally. They're actually, they're scientists that are thinking, there are mushrooms who are bio, bioluminescent naturally. And uh, scientists are thinking about ways that they can take that quality of mushrooms and apply them to plants in order to make the plants glow naturally. Um, some designers are thinking about how could we uh, take the, that property of bioluminescence and apply and make mat building materials out of uh, things that are bioluminescent in order to not need electricity, for example. Another example that I gave you uh, on Monday was the idea of uh, building using mycelium as a building material, which is the roots of mushrooms. So thinking about how you could build a house out of the, the roots of of mushrooms and part of the reason why you would want to do that is because with the roots of mushrooms you can actually grow them into the shape that you want them to be. They're also pretty have a, a, a lot of strength uh, and structural integrity and in addition to that they take uh, absorb carbon dioxide. So what materials can we use to make buildings out of that actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. All right so next we're going to do Tinkercad. Um, so those of you who want to stick around and do a deep dive with Tinkercad, I'm going to stick around for as long as you want, um, or as long as is reasonable <laughs> for us to, to play around in Tinkercad. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to make sure that we get to before two o'clock uh, to talk to teachers and adults uh, about how to uh, access the recordings of this series and also how to uh, submit your students' work or your children's work to the Children's Museum for the um, for our virtual exhibit. 
So for those of you who are children who are on, uh, I'm gonna ask you to get on Tinkercad right now. So Tinkercad is tinkercad.com. Uh, if you don't have an account already, um, you can join now uh, by creating an account. You can also just hang around and watch while I'm demonstrating and then access the video uh, later to follow along. But I'm gonna ask kids to try to get on Tinkercad right now. And those of you who are here as an adult, um, I just want to talk to you just about those things that I had said before. Um, so the cool down activity today is to tinker together and to prototype your idea using Tinkercad. So I'm going to present a demonstration of that. Um, but before I do that, I just want to let adults know that on Monday, um, this uh, web page for the Boston Children's Museum uh, will be updated with all of the recordings. Uh, from this week. So there should be five recordings. There also is going to be an entry form uh, for submitting your students work. So the entry form looks like this uh, and it will be linked to that page. And this um, is where you'll submit the students work. The deadline is June 1st. So you have two weeks uh, to work with your child or work with your students to get a design together. And it should be in response to one of those two prompts. And all of that information is in the form. Uh, for teachers uh, who are here particularly, but I know parents are also acting as teachers, I want to let you know that uh, this design project is aligned with the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education standards. Uh, it is even aligned with the power standards outlined by uh, Commissioner Riley uh, as standards that are essential or prerequisite to moving on to the next grade level. Um, so for sixth grade, it's technology and engineering standards. Um, and for sixth grade, uh, the, the expectation is that students are defining the criteria and constraints of a design problem uh, and then going through and solving it. Uh, for seventh grade, it's not just thinking about constraints and criteria, but also thinking about how you might evaluate solutions to a problem. And then for eighth grade, it's, you know, earth and space sciences and thinking about the impact of human activities on the planet uh, in, in regard to climate change. I want to remind you about this additional teaching resource, which is that Instructable that we keep talking about. Lewis can send you that in the chat. Uh, thinking about the word constraints, uh, constraints is just like any type of requirement um, or limit that you put on a project. So this is like an example of like if you're thinking about like a construction project, for example, some of the constraints might be time, they might be cost, um, it could be the risk of doing the job, as well. Um, so it could be the quality, it could be the resources. So in thinking about constraints, it's like whatever limit that you put on a particular project. Um, and for me, I think when I think of constraints, even like a time constraint, like you need to get this done in two minutes, or you need to get this done in five minutes. Or you might even think of like a cooking show or like Project Runway, for example, like in a cooking show, it could be the constraint could be you need to make a meal, but you can only use these three ingredients to make the meal. Or with Project Runway, I love um, that show when they have the um, unconventional design challenge where it's, you need to make a ball gown, but you can only use stuff that you can find at like a camping store, for example. Um, so that's constraints. I mean, as teachers, we put constraints on assignments all the time as well. Um, when I did the, um, when students did our Make It Real uh, competition recently that we just awarded the prizes for, one of the constraints that we put on it because it's an Autodesk contest is the uh, students' designs have to, they have to use Tinkercad in some way for uh, elementary and middle school. So that's constraints. And criteria is just like when you're thinking about like evaluating a project, uh, what are the things that you're looking for that make it good? So this is just an example of the rubric from the Make It Real contest. Some of the criteria we were looking at were technical skills, innovation, impact, in the way that students presented their work. Um, for eighth graders, maybe students are involved with the way that the project is being assessed, and that would be their input on the criteria of the project. Uh, this rubric is also part of that uh, Make It Green Instructable. So any questions before we get on to Tinkercad? Lewis? One moment, just double checking. We have one person asking, what is a code? What is a, a code? A code? What is a code? Not oh. sure what that is in reference to. It could have been 
code blocks. Um, and code is like any, actually code is just anything symbol that you're putting in place of something else. But when we talk about code, typically we're thinking about like computer programming. So code blocks is a way of using computer programming or computational thinking in order to create a design. I hope that helps. We have another question. I believe that I read an architect can give feedback on a project. How do we submit our students' project to an architect? The be prizes or some external reward for participating in this challenge? So the reward for participating in the challenge is to have your work featured uh, by the Children's Museum, and we're going to figure out a way to celebrate it in some way in June. Uh, in terms of getting feedback from an architect or someone from the construction industry, the United Way is actually supporting uh, teachers who are in Boston. Uh, so if you registered with your institutional uh, email account so we can figure out that you're a teacher, in Boston, the United Way may be reaching out to you uh, this week to see if we can connect you with an architect or an engineer or someone from the construction industry in order to support your class uh, with the project. So that is an opportunity for teachers in Boston. You also have my email address through the registration. So if you want to email me about that, um, I'm happy to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly, and I just want to mention that Polly Carpenter from uh, Boston Society of Architects is happy to help with architects giving feedback. Awesome. Thank you, Polly. Thank you for always being awesome. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We have another question from a participant. Uh, can you show how to get to the recording? Uh, I can't right now, but uh, Louis, can you send the link out to the in the chat? To the is recording? it the Children's Museum link? Yep. Yeah, so the recordings aren't going to be there until next week, so Monday, I think, is when they plan to have them up. Okay. So if you go to that link, they won't be there yet today, but they will be there um, on Monday. Adding the link now. Any other questions? All right, so the next um, app, oh, sorry. Nope, no other questions, sorry. So the next step is um, I'm going to stick around uh, for as long as uh, people are interested in working in Tinkercad. Uh, so I'm going to show you how I made that abalone house uh, replica in Tinkercad. So those of you uh, who are sticking around for the Tinkercad session, uh, get on Tinkercad right now, or you can watch as well. Uh, so I'm going to be demonstrating it in video. So for step one uh, in making, so we're again working on I'm showing you how I created this and then giving you some inspiration to do it yourself. So for step one, we're going to uh, try to make a biomorphic shape using the Scribble tool. So there's a, a feature in Tinkercad called Scribble. It's one of our, uh, it's located in the basic shapes menu. And I'm going to show you how I used Scribble in order to create uh, the exterior of the abalone house. So here's just a video, and I'm going to talk you through it. And then I'm going to give you a couple minutes to play around yourself in Tinkercad. So this is what Tinkercad looks like. This is my dashboard in Tinkercad. Uh, when you go to Tinkercad, if you, uh, you're going to click on Create New Design, like you see there. Uh, what you see me doing there is dragging out the scribble shape. And in dragging out the scribble shape, it brings you to this different work plane where you can draw something in 2D. So this is me taking, some, taking an idea that I have in my mind and I'm putting it, um, I'm drawing it in 2D. As I said before, I am uh, an, an English teacher who came to technology through a love of art. So I really like the scribble tool because I can freeform draw. What you see me, I'm gonna pause for a second. Um, so what you see me doing here, I'll rewind it a little bit. So what you see me doing here is so once you draw uh, a shape in scribble, it'll show up then in 3D on your work plane. So what I was doing there is you could see me rotating it and tipping it. And then I was using, so hitting command D to duplicate the shape. And then I'm holding down. So you see the, uh, the handles, those little squares uh, along the edges of shapes. 
you can use those in order to manipulate the size of your shape. Um, and I'm making that scribble shape a little bit smaller, but I want it to kind of keep the same proportions as the original 2D drawing that I made. So I'm holding down the shift key to make it a little bit smaller. Um, so I do the command D to duplicate it, shift key to make it uh, a little, hold down the shift key and uh, pulling down on the uh, handles to make it a little bit smaller. Uh, and I also tilted it a little bit using rotate. So you see me doing that, I'm tilting it slightly backwards. And then I'm just hitting command D, command D, command D, command D over and over again. And that is smart duplicate. And that's one of my favorite things to do in Tinkercad. So what you see me doing now is then drawing a box around everything that I just designed and then grouping it together. So it's a lot of different pieces that I just grouped together. So it's red right now. But ultimately, you'll see that red go away. And then it's all one piece. And then the last step that I want to do, so you see me using that arrow, uh, that black arrow at the bottom to uh, lift it up off the work plane. And then I'm using rotate again to, I just want to tip it a little bit more. And once I have it, and you see me using that view cube in the upper left hand corner because um, I want to kind of look at it, look at my design from different angles. And then I am grabbing this box, and this is a hole. So you can, when you're grabbing shapes from the basic shapes menu, uh, you can, the box and the cylinder come as like both holes and solids, or you can turn the shape into a hole um, using the shape panel. The reason why I'm doing this is I want to see that part that's hanging below the work plane. I want to uh, make that part go away because I want it to be flat at the bottom. So I'm lining up that, um, that hole with where I want, what I want to subtract from the shape. So you see me uh, selecting everything again together um, and then I'm grouping it so that it's just uh, one shape and it's flat at the bottom. So does anybody have any questions about what I just did? Because what I'd like everyone to do right now who's sticking around is on, in on Tinkercad is I'd like for you to make a biomorphic shape with Scribble. So the biomorphic shape that I made was uh, the outline of the shell, the abalone shell. And that's what I use to, to do my biomorphic shape. You might want to use Scribble to make like a leaf, uh, for example and then bring it onto the work plane and extrude it. So make it um, taller. Uh, you could make it taller or you could extrude it by making it wider as well. That's another way of using the scribble shape. Any questions so far, Lewis? Uh, we just have one uh, person who has joined us a little late, uh, wants to know what we were talking about when we started. Uh, they missed out on that part. Um, so I will say that the recording uh, will be online. Uh, Louis, can you send that out in the chat again where the recording is going to be? Today we're Absolutely. talking about design thinking in Tinkercad. We talked about design thinking. Uh, we talked about how we'd apply this thinking to the design challenges that we're working on. And we also talked about how architects and engineers and designers uh, use nature as a design partner. So we talked about the concept of biomimicry. And right now we are playing around in prototyping, so kind of going through the design thinking process. Um, so using Tinkercad as a prototyping tool uh, in order to make something that is inspired by nature. And we're just tinkering together right now. Any other questions about playing with Scribble in Tinkercad? I can show the video one more time too, because it's pretty quick. Mm -hmm. No questions as of yet, though. Okay. So again, this is Tinkercad. This is my dashboard. I'm creating a new design here. You see in Tinkercad, there's a bunch of basic shapes on the right-hand side. You can drag them out onto the work plane and play with them. I'm choosing the Scribble tool, which is kind of a special shape that allows you to design in 2D. And then you can make it, well, it's going to enter into the work plane in 3D but you can even extrude it further. I didn't do it in this case. I actually did the opposite of extruding. I made it um, smaller. So I'm tipping it 
over using the rotate tool because I want it to kind of lean forward and then kind of arch back. I duplicated that shape uh, using command D and then moved it out using the arrow keys actually so I could see it. I'm manipulating the size to make it smaller. I'm hitting the shift key so that it maintains the same proportion. I'm using rotate to tip it. And then once I, so with smart duplicate, one of the things that you're noticing is when you do command D, if you do other actions after um, you duplicate it, like you move it slightly or you make it slightly, slightly smaller, it's gonna keep repeating that over and over again. So that's why um, it kept tipping ever so slightly and getting smaller ever so, so slightly is because it's following that command D over and over and over again. So I'm lifting it above the work plane. So that's good to know, Kelly. And I just wanna, I just wanna highlight that. So if kids are creating an image and they edit that image and then they duplicate it, it'll duplicate even like the position of it is what yep. you're saying, right? Yeah, with smart duplicate, it's cool. not just to, um, to copy it. You can use uh, command C also to copy, but uh, if you use command D, okay. whatever little thing that you do after you um, duplicate, duplicate it it will follow that pattern so it's a great tool if you're trying to make something architectural like you could do like spiral staircases for example, with smart duplicate by uh -huh. just like changing the angle slightly so keeping the, maybe the stairs the same size or maybe reducing them like i did here but then changing the angle ever so slightly it'll duplicate it that way too so it's a great way to make spirals nice nice so and then i'm just using a hole so combining a solid with the hole in order to subtract from the shape all right, so that is the scribble tool and how I made that um, outside the shell. So the next step, oh, and one thing I just wanted to let you know too is that each week Tinkercad is doing design challenges. Uh, this week's Tinker Together design challenge is, and this I think does have prizes, um, and it is to make something cool using the scribble tool. So uh, if you make something cool today, you actually have time to submit it to the Tinker Together challenge. So it's something that you've made with using the scribble tool and you can also be combining other shapes as well. So Louis, could you share that link in the um, in the chat as well? I think I shared that with you earlier. Absolutely. And this is just the Tinkercad blog as well. You should be able to find it that way too if you're on Tinkercad. All right, so step two if you're sticking around to tinker together. Uh, the next step after I created the exterior to the abalone house, house using the scribble shape I then thought about what are some other basic shapes that I can add to make it look more like a building. So for me, I was thinking it needs a floor uh, and it also needs walls in some way. So step two is to take what you made in Scribble and to, um, and to add two more basic shapes to it. I'm pausing for a second. My video hasn't processed yet, but I do have it up here. So this is step two. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I'm going to share again. Uh, and where is it? Yep, so this is step two. So this is so this is step two. So I have my sheet, my shell, uh, I'm also going to show you how to change the color too, which is easy. So I like to make, when I'm doing stuff architecturally, for some reason, I like to make things like white and kind of feel like it makes it look modern. Um, so I'm going to change the color to white. I feel like it picks up shadows better too. There's like more of a contrast. Uh, you don't have to do it. You can make your building pink if you want or orange. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing next is adding shape. So I'm dragging uh, the block shape over. I am uh, reducing the size by using, so you can see the different handles on the edges um, do different things. So you can make it wider, you can make it taller. Um, so I was just flattening it. I like to use the arrow keys. Also, when you're using uh, Tinkercad, it is best if you use a mouse. Um, so I try to use a mouse when I'm designing and I'm using a mouse here. So I'm dragging out the handles in order to manipulate the size. So I want to make it a little bit wider. And you can also type into the boxes as well. 
um, to change the size. The sizes are in millimeters, and that's what I'm working with um, in this design. You can switch it over to inches if you want. So I'm selecting both the objects by clicking on the object. I wanted to show you that really quickly. So I'm going to pause for a second and rewind. So uh, when you see me grouping, so I'm clicking on one object, then I'm holding down the shift key and clicking on another. Uh, you could also group by uh, drawing that box around it like I do with the mouse. And what I was doing there, and I'm going to rewind again, is I was actually showing the align tool as well. So once I have the two pieces the way that I want them um, to look, I want to center that on the surface at the bottom. So that's what I'm doing there is selecting them both in the align tool so that I can just center it so that it's in the middle. So that's what I'm doing there. And then I just want to have some sort of like interior sort of wall um, to start giving it some, um, you know, more dimension to it and make it kind of look more like a building that people could inhabit. So I'm imagining inside and I was inspired by the drawing is it looks like there's sort of like pod shaped rooms inside. So I dragged out a half sphere. I'm using the arrow keys and pulling them closer to the wall. And then I'm just, I mean, the cool thing about making biomorphic shapes is like you can do things a little bit more freeform and kind of more um, just kind of natural. I don't want my shapes to extrude out the back. So that's why I keep looking to make sure that it's not uh, affecting that exterior design when I'm designing in the interior. So I'm making the half sphere wider and making it taller. Um, and then I'm just kind of adjusting it to just make it look how I want it to look. So again, if you're doing something that's more like hard, you know, angles, like 90 degree angles, um, you know, that's, it lends itself a little bit less to uh, be more freeform and natural in your design. So what you see me doing there is then I just duplicated that. So that I just did a straight up smart duplicate, just because it was more efficient than dragging another sphere out. And I also did kind of want it to reflect the, what I had manipulated to the middle one, um, kind of in the same way. So you see me just kind of, again, making sure that my interior wall doesn't extrude, extrude out the exterior. And then I'm just kind of adjusting it to make it kind of look like it is sort of fading into that exterior wall. So then I'm just smart duplicating again. And doing the same thing. And just changing the shape. And this is what I'm asking you to do right now if you're still sticking around and tinkering together. Is to take your biomorphic shape that you made in Scribble. So in this case, mine is that exterior shell. And then add some other shapes to it in order to maybe give it some more dimension as a building if you're making a building. So I added a floor and some interior walls. All right, so I'm gonna pause for a second and I'm gonna go back to my slides. Um, and then I'm gonna go back to the presentation. So sharing my screen again, and sorry about that, wasn't the smoothest, but my videos hadn't processed yet. All right, so we did step two, which is to add two or more basic shapes. Step three is now to add a shape that would provide support. So when we are designing something that is inspired by nature, um, sometimes it might not be the most structurally sound looking uh, structure. So uh, I was thinking, how could I take, you know, again, I'm looking at that image. I didn't come up with this design myself. I was inspired by the Abalone House, and I noticed that there were columns there, especially because that shell in the front was kind of like overhanging a little bit, um, and you want to put some columns there. So that's what I'm demonstrating next. So for step three, if you're following along and tinkering together, you're going to add a shape that would provide support. Um, so the shape that I decided to use is the paraboloid. So again, here's my design. 
And then I'm going to use, so I looked at the image that inspired me and I looked at the columns and I thought, which shape do I have that's a basic shape in Tinkercad that uh, could be the closest to, to what they, the designer of the Abalone House used. So I chose the paraboloid, which is a fun shape. Um, not quite a cone. Uh, not quite a half sphere, kind of a combination of them both. So what you see me doing here is um, just looking at it in terms of how big it should be. I'm also switching, so you can switch from perspective view to orthographic view. The orthographic view makes it flatter, so it takes away that kind of the perspective. Um, and I was just, because I'm sort of measuring it to see how big I should make it as compared to the building, sometimes it's good to switch over to that flat view. I'm stretching out the paraboloid, so I'm not hitting the shift key because I do want to change the proportion of it. So I'm making it tall and skinny. I was trying, sometimes when you make something really small, it's hard to, um, to rotate it. I like rot rotating it using the, um, the arrows, but I wasn't able to. So now you see me muddling along because I meant to put 180 and I put 90. <laughs> so then I'm switching it over. So you want to make sure if you're trying to make something straight, to do it at a 90 degree angle, 180 is also a good angle <laughs> to use for uh, certain functions. So now you see me moving it there and seeing if it fits where I want to put it. And again, it's just I'm noticing that it's kind of top heavy and kind of overhanging. So I think that there needs to be a column there. And the designers of the building thought so too. You also see me changing in the snap grid from uh, one millimeter to 0.5 millimeters. And the reason why I did that is when I use the arrow key, it moves things in smaller increments. Uh, so it's a little bit more precise. Sometimes you want to put things at like five millimeters just if you're trying to move stuff really quickly across the work plane. But if you're designing something that's really small and precise, you might want to change your snap grid. So here then I'm just using smart duplicate to duplicate the column and moving it over a little bit. And I want it to align for the most part. This is a very organic shape, but I still want it to align structurally with the column that's in front of it. Also just kind of for symmetry reasons. And then I'm using Smart Duplicate. And I'm noticing now that there's a flaw in my design because the the column, it shouldn't intersect with the little interior wall that I put there. So I want to, at first I thought, well, maybe I'll move like where the column is, but that wouldn't really make structural sense. I wanted to kind of align with that back one as well. So I realized now that I need to change the size of my uh, interior room. So I didn't group everything together in this case because I knew that I might want to continue to ma manipulate the shapes and keep them separate shapes. Ultimately, I do end up grouping the whole structure, but I'm not quite ready to group it yet. Uh, and this is one of the reasons is I wanted to change that wall again so that there's space between the column and the wall. And then this one's easier, so I'm just smart duplicating it. And then moving on, uh, moving it over to the other side where it fits. And things aren't going to be perfectly aligned and perfectly symmetrical because this is a biomorphic, really organic looking shape. And I'm making it, I actually had to make this one a little bit taller. I was trying to keep kind of consistency in the size, but this one needed to stretch up a little bit. So that's kind of the constraints of working uh, with more kind of organic biomorphic shapes is things aren't going to be as precise. Uh, so the next step, so there's five steps in this process. Step four, is to add a window or a door. So if you are tinkering along with me, uh, then step four is to add a window or a door and to make it transparent. So that's what I'm showing next. I'm wondering if my video is there yet. And it is, yay. Sometimes things work out. <laughs> so this is step four. I think it's not fully processed yet, but it's okay. Um, so for step four, <laughs> this is the hardest part of this design. And this took me forever. And I'm actually going to show you how I kind of messed up, uh, but it's okay. Uh, so for step four, I'm trying to make a window that's like 90 degrees so that it's um, straight from the, or um, it's coming up straight from the floor at a 90 degree angle. I'm going to try to use the scribble shape to do this, which is ultimately what I did. So I'm tr trying to recreate that profile that I already created in scribble but I want to make it solid rather than um, just like the 
the wavy line. Uh, so I'm actually using another part of the scribble tool that helps you fill in space quickly. Um, so you see me using that here to kind of color it in. Uh, it's kind of like vector drawing, sort of. So you see me just kind of trying to fill in as much as I can because I want to make this a window. And then if you have spots left over, it's okay. You can then just use <laughs> the pen to fill those in. So I'm trying to make it kind of as straight as I can at the bottom because the first time I did this, it was a little wavy at the bottom and it hung out the, the bottom of it. So I'm just trying to fill in those holes to make it a solid shape. You can always go back if you miss something. And this would be a fun shape to actually um, to extrude in the other direction too, but I'm not doing that, but this could be some, a fun way to play around uh, extruding. So taking something that's flat and um, making it taller. So here I am, uh, so moving the window, I'm making it thinner, I'm rotating it at, to make it 90 degrees. Oops, and then it's 89, so I'm typing it in 90. I'm using that black arrow to lift it. And I'm trying to put this on the front of the building. And the, the thing that's tricky about it is it needs to kind of match the shape um, of the shell. But it also, I want it to be in front of the columns. I want the columns behind the glass. So it makes it really hard to actually fit it. Ultimately, I do. But you see me making it smaller. You can also skew the shape. So to, uh, you see me here stretching it out wider to try to see if I can fit it um, in the shell shape. Ultimately, it doesn't work out very well. But I do want to show you how to um, make the window transparent. So basically, how I got the one to fit that you see in the original model is I drew that shape over and over again until it fit. I'm thinking there's got to be a better way of doing it though, but you see how it's kind of sticking out the side and it's driving me crazy and I'm making it thinner. So you have to keep making it thinner. And ultimately when it kind of looks sort of how I want it to look, not totally, I'm going to show you how I can make it transparent, but see how now the columns are peeking out in the front. Don't want that. So I made it a little bit smaller. So you see me going back and forth and manipulating it. Ultimately it doesn't really work out. Um, so moving that forward in front of the columns. And then again, because I'm manipulating the shape, it keeps getting thicker because I'm not hitting the shift key. So now I'm making it thinner. And then it sort of looks like a window from here. So I am then going to go into the shape. So when you click on the shape panel, I can click on transparent and then it makes it a window. The trick about that though, is if you group the window with the building, then it won't be transparent anymore. So if you're adding windows to things, you need to keep them separate from the structure or else it will turn solid. Again, even if you keep it multicolor, the transparency doesn't um, stay. So you have to keep the windows a separate part from the sheet. All right, the last step, if you're still hanging in here, this is the last step, but I think this is really important for architectural, um, drawings or representations because you want to show a human or it could be like a car for example my daughter does a lot of those uh, lego architecture sets and in the lego architecture sets there's always like a little person or a little car so that you can give a sense get a sense of the relationship between uh, the human size and the scale of the building so i'm going to show you how i added people to this and this is the last step and it's pretty quick I know this is going long, but thank you for those who are sticking around. Uh, and for those of you who didn't, this is, uh, the recording will be here. Uh, so this was my original model. Um, I made a copy of it to take the people out, but you can see that it wasn't, the other one isn't perfect either. So how I'm adding a person is I'm actually Googling a silhouette of a person in Google Images. I'm looking for a PNG because I would want the white not being in the background. So that's one of my little tricks is I look, I search for a color that's transparent um, or an image that's transparent in the color drop down, uh, And then that will help me find PNGs that don't have the color in the background. I chose this one from Pixabay because I really want to try to use stuff that's, um, I'm not violating anyone's copyrights. So I know that Pixabay lets people 
Um, designers use their images for free. Uh, they ask that you make a donation if you can. Uh, I do sometimes donate to them. Um, so this is an SVG converter. So I just found this online. You need to be careful with some of this, the converters that you find online because um, they, even this one, if you click on the wrong button, um, it's not, um, you can end up downloading stuff that you don't want to, but there are a lot of free. So I want to uh, take my PNG file and convert it to an SVG. And the reason why I want to do that is Tinkercad, you can import SVGs to Tinkercad. So all I was doing there is just using an online converter to change my PNG to an SVG file. So that's a scale vector graphic. Um, and then I'm importing my SVG to Tinkercad. Oftentimes Tinkercad is going to yell at you when you try to import an SVG because it's too big. So I changed the scale down to 10 versus 100. And then it accepted my SVG. So it still probably is going to come in huge. So there's my SVG. So I'm going to want to make it smaller. So that's what you see me doing here. And the purpose of doing this is I really just want to show, because this is an architectural model, I want to show the relationship between how, hum how humans are going to experience the building. So all I'm doing here is rotating it. And because it's, I've made it so tiny, it's kind of hard to manipulate. So that lifts it. And then I want to rotate it. So I'm trying to do that in a weird angle. So I think I decided to type into it, so I'm making him. 90 degrees and then moving it back and I'm trying to move it closer to the building. Um, oh, I also wanted to tip him sideways. I think I made him uh, at about 45 degree angle. And then I'm moving him back closer to the building because I just want to see uh, where he is in relation to the building because as we get closer, you see it gets smaller because I'm in that perspective view. And then I'm moving him, moving him and I'm seeing if he can get behind the, the glass which he can, and making them smaller. Now he's really tiny, but I do kind of want, I wanted it to have that sort of like soaring effect um, where you're kind of in awe of nature. I did make him a little bit bigger. So then you see, so I'm just manipulating him and moving him around and I think he gets like stuck behind the glass. The last thing I just want to show you is then how if you don't want to um, have a whole bunch of different PNGs how, uh, of silhouettes, you can um, make him into a part and put him into your part collection so that you can go back and grab him or another one of your PNGs later. So I'm um, being fussy about his size. But there he is. I think he's, he's floating. <laughs> so this is the importance of using your camera controls. Um, so there he is. And then the next step is then I'm going to turn him into a part once he's not floating above the surface. I really was getting fussy with the perspective. Sorry about that, this is a little boring. Um, there he is. So there he is in relation to the building. All right, and then I'm going to select him. I think I had trouble selecting him. All right, now I'm moving him over. <laughs> and then that kept happening. Sorry, guys. All right, so now I have him selected. I'm going to click Create Part. And then the cool thing about the parts um, feature of Tinkercad is you can create something, make it a part. So I'm going to call him Man Pointing, I think. And then he's in my parts collection once I save him so that the next time I go into my parts collection, I can find him and then I can just easily drag him out and not have to go through that process again. So you see that I have uh, other silhouettes. Um, so here you can see how I can grab the, this person and change the angle. Um, and you can see that's how I got the, the figures into the space so that you can get a sense of the scale between humans and buildings. So that is basically all I have to share for today. Uh, thank you for those. A lot of you troopers are sticking around. Uh, I hope that you're enjoying Tinkercad. 
I'm hoping that you continue uh, to tinker together with us. Uh, and also that you uh, submit that if you're a teacher or a parent that you submit uh, your child's design so that we can uh, feature them uh, at the Children's Museum exhibit, uh, the virtual exhibit. So again, please email me uh, if you have any questions about that. Uh, Louis, I want to thank you for being such a trooper and hanging around. We went a half an hour over tinkering together, but I hope that uh, you enjoyed tinkering. Uh, together with me. I've enjoyed tinkering together with you. So thank you so much for your help. Uh, Louis, any last words or questions or comments that seem to be burning before we go? Uh, no, thank you so much for sharing this, kids. Thank you so much for participating and asking questions. Uh, I learned a lot today and I will definitely be uh, purchasing a Cricut in the near future to, you know, start designing and creating items. I'm, I've been inspired today for sure. Awesome. Thank you, Lewis. You're always inspiring. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you for tinkering together. Thank you for um, being part of this webinar series with us. Um, and can't wait to see what you make. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Take care. Goodbye.